Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining me. I'm excited. Today's uh, episode is uh, special. As you can see, we have more than one person uh, here. So today we're interviewing four of the Harvard undergraduate seniors who are all going to be attending the Schwarzman Scholars Program in China next year at Tsinghua University. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. So diving right in, you are all seniors about to graduate. Uh, and you're about to embark on this grand, uh, if not a little mysterious, but uh, exciting adventure, nevertheless, to China uh, this next fall or this fall in just uh, you know a half a year or so. Why, for you all, uh, was it you know of interest to go abroad, and more specifically, why was China on the radar for you all? So I uh, grew up in France, the U.S. and Germany, so with kind of an international background, but I didn't know anything about China until I got to Harvard. Uh, and so I started taking Chinese class initially here um, just for the language because I was interested in language. And through that, I really, you know, got an exposure to China and started getting the sense that China is going to be extremely important over the next few decades, especially in my area of interest, which is economics and AI. And so over the course of my time at Harvard, I have done a lot of stuff related to research on China. And I thought, you know, I've never been able to go. The best opportunity is to spend a year on the ground. And Schwartzman was the way to do that. Yeah, so for me, I want to be um, an international lawyer, someone who works in foreign relations. And I kind of agree with Elliot that, like, there's no denying that China not only occupies a big role now, but that that role is only going to become even more outsized um, in the future. And I felt like it, this would be basically just a once in a lifetime opportunity to understand how are the people that someday I might be interacting with in China on the other side of the table, um, whether I'm doing international law or foreign relations, how do they conceive of their place in international law? Um, and I feel like that kind of having that sort of dialogue um, is something that maybe prior generations of diplomats or, or foreign relations or lawyers had not done. And so I'm really looking forward to learning about how they conduct law, how they think about law. Um, but there's also for me a language element as well. I started taking Chinese last year, nowhere near an expert or pro. I feel it gets harder every day. <laughs> um, they say that living in a place can you know, help you learn it. So I will you know, test that theory and we'll see if it's true next year, hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah, for me, I think there's both the political and the professional um, and, and the personal, really. The personal being I am really excited about the idea of traveling for a year after we graduate. I think, you know, so much of my life up to this point has been clear school after school after school. And this is obviously an academic program, but it's also just a chance to see another part of the world and, you know, spend real time immersed, like Fawaz was mentioning, in another country that has so much importance to the future. But then on top of that, I've always had a pretty deep interest in American foreign policy. And no matter how you look at it, if you think about China as a competitor for the United States, it is invaluable to understand how China views itself. What does it hope to accomplish in the world and how will it go about doing that? But if you look at China as a potential partner for the United States, then it's also critical that we understand what are the areas in which there can be collaboration and cooperation moving forward. And I would love to explore that while in China. Yeah. So obviously everyone's experiences are all very different. But for me, I'm actually one of the, uh, I think, 20 or 30 Chinese scholars. So um, I was born and raised in China, but I did come to the States pretty early um, when I was 11. I was at the Bay Area, then I went to boarding school. So for me, Schwartzman is like a way um, to come home, honestly, to uh, spend more time with my parents. And this is like a very personal reason, obviously, to enjoy the food. Um, and also, you, you know, in China, Tsinghua is like the, a big deal. It's like people know it more than Harvard and um, all the U.S. universities. So like my grandparents think this is like a huge deal <laughs> and they're very happy for me. And yeah, like I plan on going to graduate school. Um, after Schwartzman, probably somewhere in the New England area. So, but to be like pulled up here for another like six years, it's just like a deeply upsetting fact. <laughs> so I, I want like one year to like cleanse myself of this, like, you know, ivory tower energy or whatnot, but sort of just, it's like, you know, rainy, drippy weather outside forever, basically. Totally fair. You'll find Beijing to be, are you from the Beijing area? I, I am. Yeah. Technically. Okay. Yeah. Well, you'll find it to be equally cold. If not cold <laughs> that's true. That's true. As you know, more dry. Yeah. 
So who here has been to, been lived in China before? I know Andy has. Never lived in China, just visited. Visited, yeah. I have been to all the Chinas except inland China. So ah. Macau, Taiwan. The very Hong diplomatic Kong. way yeah. of saying it. <laughs> Um, I spent a summer in Beijing after the sophomore year of high school. Sophomore, so was, this was pre pre COVID. Yes, yes. Sure. You guys pre COVID. Pre COVID, yeah. Definitely a different time. How do you imagine China will be when you all go join there this uh, this fall? Any expectations? I mean, one thing that's interesting is just how China has from what I've read and heard, been so removed from the rest of the world through COVID and particularly the United States in the last couple of years, whether that's due to politics, the, the pandemic or, or a variety of other factors, the number of international students who are in China has seemed to drop off. Um, and so I would love to see, you know, how connected does Beijing feel to the rest of the world? Is this still a city that is sort of at the heart of a country that is going to be playing an active role in international relations and international economics. Um, what does the energy there feel like? Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, COVID did hit China pretty hard. And, um, but I think now consumer wise, everything's sort of um, up and running again and back to normal. Mm. But I do think like Arjun said, the sort of international population has really shrunk. Um, but I think this is just like a temporary sort of setback. Um, you know, the Schwarzman Scholars Program is one of these things trying to tackle this. And I do think um, to say like Beijing has like no relevance in like international politics would be <laughs> more than an overstatement. Um, and as someone who's, who's from Beijing, I think um, I was just back there over the winter and it's like very vibrant. I visited um, Beida actually. Um, and, you know, there's also the Yinching Scholars Program there. There's a lot of people there. I feel like it's still like very much alive and even the tech scene is is like warming up so yeah a lot of things are looking up and i think you guys will like it you guys will enjoy it very much i'm excited for the food yeah. <laughs> um bring the experience briefly back here stateside you guys are all here at harvard harvard seniors and the first uh you know harvard college students on the podcast what has the experience been like these last four years? And you guys are, you know, the COVID generation, you know, started, I believe, in roughly 2019. Um, and you're all set to, or 2020, um, and you are set to graduate this summer. Um, you experienced the height of COVID, you know, 2020 through 2021 to 2022. What was the college experience like during that time? Uh, I, I'd say extremely restrictive. Um, I came here right in September of 2020, and the policy was that you couldn't host guests in your own suite. Uh, all classes were online. There were no, uh, any Harvard buildings were open. So the only place you could socialize was in restaurants or something like that. Um, and I think that really conditioned a lot of, you know, the way that people interacted and the types of friends that people made. Uh, but it's gotten obviously much better over time. So I think tough at the start, but definitely improving um, and fully normal now. Yeah, same. I just, I'll never forget that era of the Zoom <laughs> classes. Um, I think, you know, kind of leaving from that and coming back to campus, it gave me like a real appreciation that I might not have had had I gone straight to the normal Harvard campus. Um, definitely tried to make use of like actually showing up to classes and like, you know, trying to meet with professors when I could. I actually also think that I was more, um, more academically engaged. I think it's kind of hard to be on the computer. You're, you're there for hours a day, class after class, and then you're also going to do homework on your computer. So you never get a break. Uh, but when you're on campus around people, eating with them in the dining hall, seeing them in your classes, um, I think a lot of good things happen to you that maybe, you know, you, you don't notice unless you did formerly had that experience online. So uh, I think that's definitely how it shaped my experience. It's kind of been like, you know, more or less an upward trajectory from that. So try to spin it, I guess, as a positive. <laughs> yeah. That's from you guys. Yeah, I would say for me, I got pretty lucky in the sense that I was in um, Shanghai the whole time during freshman year. So I worked um, full time, um, nine to five, one more like 10 to seven. And then I went home and my classes started at 1030 p.m. And they went to like 3 a.m. Um, sometimes, like um, I usually cut the CS50 lectures and just watch the recording. 
Um, it's not totally necessary we go to CS50 lectures. But it was a very jarring experience because I felt like I had like a working life outside of school, but I was only like fresh out of high school. And then coming to campus after that, I'm like, oh, so this is what college feels like. It's so different from what I anticipated. And then now I know I, we all are um, as second semester seniors and we're thinking, oh, wow, like we're going to graduate so soon. I think part of it is, is really because our experience is truncated. Um, it really feels like just three years. I think the first year is just sort of a icky, sort of like gimme. Yeah. Mm. One of the things that Andy mentioned that reminded me of another takeaway that I had about our college experience is just that, you know, on the one hand, Fawaz mentioned that it's tough constantly being on your computer and having everything be virtual. On the other hand, because you have access to work that you can do from anywhere, I felt that our cohort of students was actually very plugged in to the world beyond Harvard in ways that might not have been true for a traditional incoming class of freshmen or, or people moving through Harvard in general, just because the whole world had to get used to remote work and virtual internships and jobs. And so mm -hmm. you could do work for anyone from anywhere while taking classes at school. And I think that was actually able to foster a lot of unique engagement on either political issues or, or with jobs across the economy. And, and that was pretty special. Um, whether or not it's the, the classic college experience is debatable, but I, I actually valued it quite a bit. My grad first grad program in 2019 summer, so just avoided the COVID experience. But yeah, this, I mean, obviously COVID has impacted a generation of students, including yourselves. Um, it remains to be seen exactly for the wider population as well, how that impact might really impact societally, uh, whether it's work versus productivity or educational incomes. And some of those indicators hasn't been for the best. Um, you all are interested in different things here at Harvard and which you will take to China. Uh, we'd love for our audience to learn a little bit about each of your background specifically, you know, did you, when you came first to Harvard virtually and then in person from high school, did your interests stay the same? Did your interests shift um, during the COVID era? Uh, what, you know, for the students, for the listeners who might be interested in applying to Harvard one day or transferring to Harvard or applying to Harvard for uh, graduate school or others, what made you all succeed successful in you know becoming a student at harvard i think my interests have definitely shifted um i came to harvard interested kind of in international politics um and government and those sorts of things and then i spent freshman year just taking classes in many many different disciplines um, and then by sophomore year, I had kind of reoriented towards economics and I never had any exposure to that before, before Harvard. Um, but that has really become the core focus. And I've managed to integrate some of my former interests in international affairs and that type of stuff, but more from the economic angle. And that's also kind of the reason why I'm going to China. But ultimately, I think in terms of your second question of applying to Harvard, um, I think one of the important things for me was really trying to define my interests um, because, you know, like you mentioned, all of us here have different backgrounds and different perspectives. And I think it's really useful to think about what you want to do with your Harvard education and why it is that you want to come here and then explaining that in your application. Yeah, for me, I kind of knew somewhere around midpoint through high school that I wanted to be a lawyer, um, particularly constitutional law. But for me, that mostly uh, meant like focusing on domestic issues in the United States. I think coming to Harvard, Harvard, excuse me, taking history classes, meeting people from around the globe, kind of quickly taught me that there's no such thing as like a just domestic constitutional law, that constitutional law also influences the way that we engage with treaties, that we engage at the United Nations. And um, yeah, and so I, I think now I've mostly shifted uh, through my Harvard education to US foreign relations law, um, how our conceptions of national law um, of our government influence us to interact with the rest of the world and how that's changed over time um, and where that could go in the future. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just the people that I've met here, but also the, the history classes that have kind of shifted me in that direction. So, I think both Elliot and Fawaz sort of really got to the idea of how fluid interests are here and, and how dynamic that experience can be. And I think that is very true for me in that 
the closest I can get to a coherent story of how my interests have developed and, and changed at Harvard is just that there's been a constant North Star of some kind of public service. And within that, what that has meant and what that has looked like has shifted quite a bit and bounced around really um, to a lot of places that I didn't expect. I mean, I came into college thinking that I would work to figure out how public policy could be perfected to promote equity and, and growth in a lot of communities in the United States and try and get American foreign policy to be more constructive and collaborative internationally. But I quickly learned that it was service meant a lot more than just government policy. And so I spent a while trying to figure out what role the private sector might have in, in achieving some of the outcomes that I wanted to see in society. I, I did management consulting for two summers and, you know, not exactly the first industry that comes to mind when you think public service. But I mean, the cases that I got to work on were really interesting, focused on health equity and building wealth in black and brown communities. And I, I learned a lot from those. Then my sophomore year, I decided to join ROTC um, because that was another very different kind of service that I really appreciated. And it was a type of service that I had always respected, but never quite seen for myself, but wanted to try it out. Had a great year there, um, but ultimately had to step away from it for, for some personal reasons. And I mean, now I'm, I'm working back on political campaigns, but all of it sort of fits together in a, a weird quilted pattern of stuff that I believe will help me learn and, and be a better public servant. But there's never been necessarily a linear path, which I've actually liked and learned a lot from while I've been here. Absolutely. Yeah. All amazing answers. Um, for me, I've always had sort of a main interest and a side interest I've kept on the back burner. For the main interest, I've sort of um, went all sorts of places, but I came back where I started now. Um, so I, um, <clears throat> in high school, I did a lot of creative writing and I came in as a comp lit major on um, what I contended and I took home 10. And with this uh, great philosophy professor uh, named Sean Kelly, he taught um, Nietzsche's genealogy of morals. And I was like, wow, never thought about um, philosophy this way. I didn't know good and bad didn't really mean what they meant the whole, the whole time, you know. So um, I, I went to philosophy and I'm currently still a philosophy concentrator, but um, <clears throat> I'm taking a creative writing workshop now again and doing a lot of creative work. And in between, um, as I said, I was working uh, during my freshman year. I did finance. Um, I did crypto. So I did all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, OK, I, now I know very firmly what I want. And this ties to my sort of back burner side interest, which has been like sort of U.S. China. I think as someone who's greatly benefited um, in sort of improving relations between the U.S. and China since like, you know, the um, China entered the WTO is roughly when I was born until I think um, when I got into Harvard, which was like 2019. Yeah, it's been basically up and up. So now obviously we're facing some challenges and I think it wouldn't make sense if I like didn't like put myself out there for this cause. So I mean, short swing is one way of expressing that. Absolutely. Now, during your four years here at Harvard, you've taken a lot of classes. What class, in your opinion, has been the, your favorite, perhaps, mo whether it's most insightful, engaging, whether the professor has been extraordinary, you know, an extraordinarily accomplished individual in their field? What, uh, which class at Harvard would you recommend for those that are at Harvard in younger years uh, or those who might one day be at Harvard? What would you recommend? Which course was kind of an experience for you? I think for me, it was EC 1420, which is American Economic Policy with Larry Summers and Jeff Liebman. And so both of them are incredibly accomplished economists. Um, so Larry Summers was Treasury Secretary. He was president of Harvard. He's done a lot of things. Um, and Jeff Liebman worked in the Obama administration and the Clinton administration on economic policy. And so these are really huge economists who spent a lot of time talking both about the models that underpin economics from an academic standpoint, but also the policy challenges that we face. And from a very practical standpoint, from their experiences in government, what it was like and how we should think about social security and how we should think about US China economic policy. And so I think that that class was just so much content and so much insight into the policy world that like is a unique Harvard experience. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, for me, it was a class called, I, I don't remember the course numbers too long, <laughs> but it was called the Constitution in American History. And it was about 
uh, the Constitution throughout American history. But the coolest part about it was like we started off talking about what is a constitution? Um, is it the fact that it's written down on a piece of paper or is it the fact like like what makes it a constitution? And then we shifted our focus specifically to the United States and how what we conceive of it as a constitution now is actually shifted by each unique historical period, the interest of the people at that time, how it can be used for them to further their interest. Um, and so, like, for example, in the founding period, we, we kind of learned that. Uh, the Constitution was seen as legitimate, but it was mostly invoked and practiced um, and debated among, you know, the early statesmen, uh, the people who had ratified it and then who were basically implementing it and working around it. Um, but then, you know, as we move towards the 20th century and you see uh, basically the United States facing this more divided world order, suddenly it's seen as a part of national identity. And it's not just the statesmen, you know, championing it. It's also the public. It's seen as a critical part of American identity. And then even today, you can kind of see like people will just throw the Constitution into an argument like the Constitution says this, it says that. And then usually the argument can be made that the Constitution maybe says this and in fact also says that. <laughs> um, and so it's interesting the way that the identity has changed um, throughout American history. And I think that class kind of opened my eyes to it. It's not really one fixed document that we think judges have interpreted the very same statutes right. differently throughout history. And uh, we can all imagine that that will continue to happen. And so I think seeing it from that perspective was from that historical perspective is something I'll always be like really grateful and draw back on. I feel like I'm sweating bullets here. <laughs> <laughs> Insult some professor of mine in the past. Um, I mean, I've really enjoyed several of them. Uh, Gov 94 on ethnic and identity politics with professor Mullick, uh, 1796 with professor Kurtzer, but the favorite one of mine, I think was actually a gen ed, gen ed 1033, on conflict resolution with Professor Shapiro. And that class differs from the other ones in that it wasn't necessarily building expertise on any given topic. It was training us in the skills of how do you engage with other people in a productive manner? How do you get people who you know, have hated each other for decades or centuries to sit down at a table and come together to put out some kind of mutually beneficial compromise uh, for some of the toughest issues that one might face, whether that's a roommate conflict or, you know, a, a geopolitical conflict in, in the real world. And I think that kind of class that isn't just about, you know, giving us skills and, and knowledge to, to take with us into the world, but really like building the practices of how to better engage with your peers, with future colleagues in the future. Um, I mean, that felt really valuable and is one that I would definitely recommend. Well, I want to take uh, the gen ed <laughs> a little bit too late. As a <laughs> um, but for me, I would say I like to pick professors and then follow them. <laughs> so the subject matter interests me less than like the actual person teaching it. Um, with that said, I would say Peter Gordon's. Um, he's a history professor, but honestly, he's like a he was he was um, he grew up in what was known as like you know intellectual history. Um, that's sort of like European tradition. So he's like a critical theory guy. And his like Hegel and Marx course was really good. I think you start with a little bit of Kant and then you get into um, sort of you know, the thought of Hegel, which is the most important German idealist philosopher. And then you understand, oh, like how did, how did Marx like revolt against Hegel? And then, you know, like lay the foundations for, you know, I would say the modern geopolitical world order. Um, so just like from that very high sort of like intellectual vantage point, you're able to see like this bird's eye view of how how things shifted. And he teaches it in a way that's so lucid. Um, that's so, I think, to the point that like, this is not a course that you could just read like on some book. This is like, you have to be there in person. That's why I just love it so much. And I think about it like every day or every other day. But. Very cool. Very cool. So. You know, for the listeners who are students, who are once to may one day be students, definitely take uh, these uh, recommendations seriously. Uh, you know, I, the college campus is very interesting. I'm a won't say my age, but I'm a solid, a solid uh, older millennial now at this point in my life. And you all are, of course, very solidly in the Gen Z generation. Um, you know, whether it's here at Harvard or campuses around the United States, there's been a lot of conversations about uh, diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, of course, and as well as in the, of individuals and lived experiences. Uh, for your experience in these past four years, three years on campus, 
what do you feel the conversation around that has been? Because we've seen it all in the media, right? People are saying there's very little freedom of discussion or uh, of thought on campus. It's very skewed in one way or another. From your personal experiences, to the extent that you want you, you can share, and of course, your own opinions, what has that experience been like for you? I think one of the things that I have wished Harvard was better at was finding opportunities to bring people who have very different points of view into productive dialogue. I think that's not something specific to Harvard, but it's just a place where I've noticed it a lot, where naturally people tend to seek out the folks who they're comfortable with, who they feel that they can be at home with, they feel safe with, and that's how friend groups form. And some of the richest conversations that I've had have all been with my friends and amongst friend groups. And, you know, while those conversations are great, they've been the backbone of my Harvard experience. Because of that self-selection that occurred at the very beginning, there isn't a ton of debate to be had because generally speaking, a lot of us are on the same page. And there have been certain environments that have been able to break that. I think for me, ROTC was a really special opportunity there and that it drew in people who came from very different backgrounds than me, who viewed the world in a very different way than I did and forced us to work and learn together. And that was one of the most meaningful moments of my Harvard experience, just because I was forced to either deeply explain why I held on to a certain conviction, um, but also keep a more open mind to what other people might think. And I guess my hope for Harvard is that there can be more of those opportunities that bring those different voices together um, in kind of casual settings, as well as formal town halls or, or discussions where people are less at liberty to say what they actually think and feel. We can, unless anybody else, we can dive into another subject. Uh, for the Harvard campus itself, um, you know, for a lot of people, it's very, you know, it's appeared in movies, it's appeared in mass media and the social consciousness, of course. But, you know, for yourselves, what were some expectations of Harvard that you had going in that was perhaps changed once you actually got to here on campus? I remember before I came to Harvard, um, I had the sense that everybody was going to be like an unparalleled genius. <laughs> um, and that affected how I chose my classes freshman year, because I was very scared that I was going to walk into this class and they were going to be like doing like graduate level math. And I would be, you know, very lost. People are incredibly intelligent in lots of different ways and they have lots of different interests but it hasn't been as intimidating as i thought it would be and i've had sort of a much easier time for instance taking more challenging courses even with less of a background because i think it's a very sort of accepting um and positive place to do that type of thing. yeah for me i think um something i was kind of shocked by was the extent to which a lot of people kind of knew each other or knew a lot of people in the class when by the time they had already come to harvard um and I think there's also like in the news, there's been like multiple reports of how sort of the social inequality or socioeconomic inequality problem that um, Harvard has. I think it has gotten better over the past years. And that's a large part and due to the uh, financial aid program, which is, I think, one of the best in the country. Um, but still, the class tends to skew towards um, middle to upper upper class by class. I mean, the, the school class tends to shift tends to be middle socioeconomic class to upper and um, I think that that is a lost opportunity for, you know, people to be engaging with people from different walks of life. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, kind of like Arjun was talking about it. There's, I think, a really crucial opportunity um, for people to be meeting each other and changing the way that they view things and seeing them from a different perspective there. Absolutely. Yeah, to add on to what Elliot said, I think people are simultaneously much smarter than I thought they were, but also much dumber than I thought they were. Like, it, it's in like very unexpected ways. Like it just crops up and sometimes you're like, how, how did this happen? Like, how, how did you get here? And then other times I'm like, oh shoot, like, damn, like that's, that's crazy. It's, it's, I can't really like give positive examples, but these are sort of, every day, honestly, I'm astonished by Harvard students, both in like a good way and, and a bad way usually, but also in a very weird way. I think people are a lot weirder 
than, you know, I would say people, you know, I grew up with, I think there's just, um, I really do think the atmosphere at the university is very like much well in the life at Harvard. I think it's facing a lot of challenges, but I think compared to a lot of like, you know, institutions in different countries, let's just say China included, I think this is a privilege. Uh, speaking of uh, specifically, you mentioned, right, a lot of geniuses, a lot of smart people, maybe some not as smart people. Uh, I don't know why it's giving me a thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, one of the big controversies um, in media about Harvard and other also very important, very elite institutions is this whole uh, grade inflation situation where the vast majority of students receive A's or A minuses. And that has steadily gone up over the years. Um, and those grades are important, right, for jobs, for careers, your first few steps into the workforce. What are your kind of thoughts on the situation, perhaps? What are your thoughts on kind of like how relevant is grade inflation to an academic institution or how vi how important is it to for it not to exist? My stance is pretty strongly anti-grade inflation. And I think that's coming from France, where everything is curved to 50%. Um, <laughs> that's and, terrifying. you know, I got here and now it's like curved to like 96% or whatever. <laughs> um, I think one of the problems with great inflation is it leads people to be extremely conservative in their choice of courses. Because if you know that an A minus or a B plus or a B looks bad on a Harvard transcript, mm and you know that a course is difficult and you might not get a good grade, that incentivizes you to not take the class. And one of the problems I think with grade inflation is that it's very heterogeneous between departments and between mm -hmm. professors. And so there's a lot of like trying to figure out what is the optimal course to optimize your GPA. And that to me is detrimental to the pure intellectual exploration of Harvard. Yeah, I'm definitely in agreement that there is a great inflation problem. It exists in like different uh, at different levels, depending on the department, depending on um, the type of class, etc. Um, I also do think, though, that the reason we've seen an increase in grades over time is also because the Har a Harvard student today looks probably a little bit different than a Harvard student might have looked 60, 70, 80 years ago um, due to in you know increased educational opportunities that a larger amount of people can get basically at the snap of their fingers online, um, books that they can now get basically in their own libraries um, due to mass production, whereas in the past it would have been a privilege to have that book in your hand. And so um, I, I think that that also we know that college admissions has gotten more competitive too. And so the kids who, you know, by a snap of luck or chance of luck get into Harvard um, are you know, no, okay, now we're talking about ourselves. I, I don't <laughs> you know, the, the idea is that they are the cream of the crop. And so that being said, that might be some of the co another cause of the rising grades. Um, but also just knowing from my own anecdotal experience that there definitely is great inflation. There's definitely been um, some classes where I turned in a paper uh, that I thought was the best thing ever and mm -hmm. it got a grade that was not the best thing ever. And then the reverse, other classes where I turned in a paper that was not, not something I was proud of and it got the best grade ever. So um, I think definitely standardizing stuff around apartments, making the expectations a bit more uniform could probably go a long way towards making it fixing that problem yeah i actually really like what you said elliot in terms of everyone now focusing and feeling so much more pressure to get a perfect gpa because everyone from the outside thinks that harvard students it's super easy for you to get an a in your class um because ideally speaking people are learning without that calculation in their mind and so figuring out what it would take whether that's from within the school to change the culture and expectations of what GPAs people will graduate with or externally, like I, I don't know enough about kind of what the cutoffs are for different industries, what GPAs they expect people to have. But I think it's both an internal Harvard problem and an external one where we should ideally be employing people or accepting them for different programs based on more than the numbers of their GPA, you should have some other, perhaps more substantive way of evaluating how much they've taken away from a class. That way, it's not all about, let me get this one number right to show that, you know, I've succeeded at Harvard and am eligible for whatever it is that I'm shooting for. Yeah, I hear you guys, but I, I'm 
still, I think I'm pretty pro grid inflation because I think the great grubby behavior will occur whether or not there is inflation. <laughs> like even if like the average GPA at Harvard was like a 3.4, you're still going to have people who try to aim for a 4.0. I think it's not as big as a deal as people make it out to be. And I think Harvard's a place where everyone here is, you know, adversely selected for great grubby behavior. And then you can't be like, okay, now it's selecting people for, you know, everyone's like doing this thing. I'm like, okay, well, that's the people who got in to Harvard from high school are the people with the perfect GPAs, right? Because, I mean, or maybe not just like, in addition to the perfect GPAs, they also have like a whole slew of other things, right? And uh, I'm sure like I, I sleep, I, you know, I speak for all of us, like, you know, I'm sure we have like decent GPAs, but it's not the GPA that got us into Schwarzman Scholars, right? Like, I really don't think they care that much about mm. what that number is on your transcript. It's, you know, your, your mission statement, it's your sort of vision of what you want to get out of the program and other stuff that, that really moved them and like maybe an interview. I don't think like, you know, if your GPA was like even 0.2 lower or 0.2 higher, it would make any difference. Um, and I think a lot of jobs also feel like that. I think unless you're just going for, I don't know, like med school, then I understand, right? This is a serious problem that needs to be tackled. And again, the inter like sort of department, like... <laughs> Um, they're not adjusted, right? I know on applied math, you can get like high honors if you have like a 3.6 or something. But like for English, you need a 4.0. Mm. Like it's just like, there's just no way to standardize this. You know, that's why like people um, in, in, you know, do like pre-med, they do history of science because right? it's a perceived way to get easier for people to get a higher GPA. So I think this is a very complex problem and it's like very hard to say like, okay, now if we just curved everything to 50% like we do in France, like this will go away. I think it's just like, um, that's why I'm just rather for, uh, rather for than against this. Cause I really think like if you put in the work and you understand the stuff and you get enough grade, like sure, you deserve an A, you know, an A shouldn't be awarded to like the top students, right? But it's just like a way of showing you, you sort of like did well in the class. Uh, speaking of, grades uh you know in recent years there's been a shift within uh college applications of not making uh standardized test scores mandatory as a result i i know that for many schools now you don't have to necessarily submit an act or sat score um and that your wider high school gpa and all the extracurriculars and you, of course your you know, personal statements is through the application what are your, I don't know if you all submitted it, but what are kind of your thoughts on this shift away from having a standardized score as a part of a high school student's holistic application? So I think it's a definitely a complex question. My instinct is generally that there's problems with the way that standardized tests work, in part because they're not really standardized if people's uh, resources aren't standardized. Um, at the same time, I think one of the benefits of standardized tests was for international students because Harvard's um, department maybe doesn't understand a transcript or extracurriculars as well for someone who's coming from outside the country. Mm -hmm. And so standardized tests was a way to prove that you have the same requisite, you know, like competencies as a U.S. student. And so I think that some way of trying to measure that or, or understand people from different backgrounds is important. And so I think to me, the way we should be trying to go, which I think some people have tried to do, is to have standardized tests that also have like um, grade, like differentiation based on adverse uh, backgrounds. I know that SET, the college board proposed some kind of like diversity score, which I think we should probably be exploring more. I feel like you captured the situation. Very, <laughs> yeah, I'll just like difficult. slightly add on to what Elliot said. I think it's so difficult to get standardized testing right because if you try to sort of adjust for resources, so like socioeconomic level, first of all, and there are many ways to game that, I feel like, which is very difficult, especially with the diversity score. It's so easily gameable and people have been memeing about it forever now. Mm -hmm. But like, and then what do you like turn it to? Like, do you measure for intelligence? Right. But then intelligence is, is another like can of worms, right? Like what exactly is intelligence is like just reading comprehension and like sort of logical, like inductive reasoning or like deductive reasoning. Like if it, are, are those skills that most well equip a student to succeed in the 21st century? I'm not sure. I feel like, you know, there are a lot of things that sanitized testing, like you said, Elliot, it, like it doesn't measure and there's a lot of problems. But I also do think um, without it, 
there will be more problems. So that's why I'm like very, very skeptically endorsing some version of it that we have to fine tune and make better with research, of course. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned earlier, like certainly for the Schwarzman's program, you didn't have to submit a test score. Yeah. Thankfully, right? It's, um, <laughs> more, more about, you know, each individual's reasoning and their demonstrated leadership. <laughs> So we'll bring it back a little bit uh, to the Schwarzman's program. Uh, for you all, you know, what first made you learn or what, how did you first learn about the program that especially drew you to apply for it at your senior year? I, unless you all found out this year, <laughs> I assume, I assume earlier. For me, I had a, a friend a couple of years back who had done the program and he had been a part of one of the student organizations that I was in. He struck me as someone who, Know, had a good vision for what good opportunities in the world might look like to learn a lot and get involved in important work. And so that was what initially put it on my radar and I've sort of been following it in the background since. Exact same for me. Saw someone else do it, looked into the program, was like, wow, this looks really cool. And then, uh, yeah, just gave it a shot. Uh, freshman year, I took a class, a gen ed, uh, with Professor William Kirby uh, <laughs> here at Harvard, who spent um, a decent part of the class actually talking about Schwarzman and education in China. And so I think that was my first exposure to it. Yeah. Um, I heard from an ex-girlfriend like many years ago. And then it was the Kirby. It didn't click until I took the, 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 the class. You know, They were like, oh, Schwarzman scholars is the roads of China and this is you know, you know, the most defining relationship of the 21st century. It's a lot of slogans, right? But it sort of rubs off on us, yeah. It's very well. We should thank Professor Kirby for uh, promoting the program so well in his classes. And you guys are all shining examples of Harvard success, certainly, and being a good representation um, at the program. What do you all believe, and, you know, I think everybody touched on this briefly, right? Studying in China is a critical part of bridging the experience of students who are not from China. Um, and, in fact, the U.S. ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, who has spoken before uh, the Schwarzman's, the campus, and uh, at Tsinghua University as well, mentioned that just this last year for us, there were only 350 uh, American scholars in China at that time, whereas before COVID, there were over 15,000. For many students, there's been this shift in attitude about China in recent years, especially during the COVID years, seeing how China has locked down, um, that maybe hasn't fully even shifted back, even with China reopening this last year. Why do you all believe in your minds is students, especially internationally, especially the United States, why should they, you know, go to China to learn? And there's that argument, they're competitors, we should, you know, it's a risk to go there, or we should be maybe some even consider adversaries beyond just competition. Um, you know, why is going to China a good thing? I think I'm reminded of something that was I think said earlier, which is you might end up on the other side of a table from someone, a policymaker, a business leader, someone from China, and they might just be thinking about the world completely differently from how you think about the world. I think it's really hard to understand Chinese views on a lot of issues if you're not there. Um, and so to me, given the chance that, you know, we in our respective countries interact with Chinese uh, policymakers or other leaders, it's really important that we understand how they think. And I think spending time in China is probably a prerequisite. Yeah, I'm in big agreement. I think it's precisely now at this time when the relation seems to be getting a little tense. You see articles every now and then in like Foreign Policy or the Financial Times about the new Cold War, or about, you know, uh, this new world order that we're entering. I think it's precisely when you need to be meeting these people who think very differently than you. Um, I think doing otherwise and just chalking them up instead as like competitors or as like irrational or like anti like American haters, etc. Without, you know, actually trying to engage with them first, you, you forego a very, very valuable and important opportunity. Um, and I think an opportunity for collaboration um, for for innovation together. And I think there's a lot of uh, potential for that. And I think also, 
um, what can occur if that opportunity is foregone, like the consequences are just too, you know, potentially catastrophic that we shouldn't risk it. We should always try to maintain um, the dialogue with other countries and try to reconcile whatever competition or whatever, um, you know, disagreements we have in, in the most uh, diplomatic way. Yeah, I mean, to echo what's been said, friend or adversary, understanding is an incredibly valuable thing. And, you know, there's so many different issues that China is stepping up to play a larger role in, whether it's international development work, AI stuff, climate reform, um, or any number of other things. China will be in play on the international stage, and the U.S. has to understand how they're approaching each of those different domains. Um, I am currently writing my, my senior thesis on nationalism and national identity in India. Um, and the big takeaway has just been how important self-image is to how a country conducts itself internationally. So how do you see yourself fitting in to the world order and interacting with other parties? We as Americans might view your actions in a certain way, but like Elliot was saying, if you are seeing the situation completely differently and your role in that situation differently, the calculations on whether or not your behavior is threatening or offers possibilities for partnership um, are really hard to read. And so I think being there and, and getting that immersive experience would be really valuable. And then on top of that, um, to Fawaz's point about just escalating tensions, I think throughout history, there's so many examples of personal ties being the thing that stops people short of national conflict that, you know, someone happens to have a, a personal friendship or a relationship uh, from their career or, or education that allows them to take that step of trust, go out on a limb and assume best intentions rather than worst ones. And I think all of us getting to meet more international students and be in China, that's those are relationships that'll be really valuable. Yeah, I agree with all three of you for sure. Um, and I think <clears throat> broadly speaking, I take this from the uh, Professor Kirby Gen Ed is like sort of volunteerism over like structuralism. The the idea that sort of individuals do like in some ways like make history more than the structuralist forces, sort of factors at play. And one example I always think about is Liang Cheng, right? He was one of the first um people that that um the Qing government sent to the US who went he went to a boarding school called Andover and he ne negotiated the Boxer Indemnity Fund, which basically led to, you know, how like what, what like colleges are in China right now and sort of the relationship between Harvard and China is super key. And it's basically because he played like baseball with like President Roosevelt. they like they were on the same team. And he was like, remember me? And he's like, yeah. And then they had a I'm like, that's crazy, right? Like like basically like this guy became the founder of Tsinghua University. He's the godfather of Tsinghua University. He got the funds to create the school, right? Because Tsinghua was at first a feeder school, like a boarding school for Harvard. And then it became its own um University. Correct me if I'm if I'm remembering this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, it's crazy how there's like one guy ends up just establishing this entire program, and like now we have Schwarzman scholars, which is Harvard students going back to China. Like that's absolutely crazy. I think it blows my mind, and I think this is something I always come back to: just how like individuals end up just really shaping um, the course of history. Although it seems like it could be determined by like economic factors, you know, with. Professor Graham Allison's thing on like Thucydides trap and whatnot, right? But it's like always these stories I really come back to that have so much power over me. Yeah. I think something that Arjun said that I'm thinking about a lot is about, like about how nationalism and national identity is formed. It's like in the case of China, I think the doctrine there is very much informed by the history that they've experienced with the West. Um, and like it goes as far back as the Opium War. It's the way that Britain basically plundered China um, and then forced them to sign what in, Ch in Chinese they call the unequal treaties. Um, and then, you know, Hong Kong, Taiwan, like all of these things are things that are taught, right? And whether or not they hear our perspective doesn't matter because that's what that's what they know. Um, and so I think it's in America, we learn our history, but we don't learn how other people learn their history, right? And, and I would assume that's generally the case in other countries. They learn their history. They have their events that they cling to. It forms their national identity. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it can be used to be like, our national identity is that we have been, you know, touched and plundered by all these other states and therefore, you know, used incorrectly, that can be, that can basically spur nationalists and uh, tendencies that can eventually lead to violence or war, et cetera. And so it's upon us, you know, here in the United States, but also 
for, upon people in China to learn how our historical events and how our past conflicts have shaped our national identity now um, mm -hmm. and how we can basically temper those conflicts. Uh, and last thing I want to add is I think it's very important to separate governments from people. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I'm very excited about that we're going to do in the program is not just go to China and listen to a bunch of like Chinese officials and like academics, et cetera. But we're, I think we get a chance to travel around mm -hmm. um, China and participate in different activities and talk to the people who live in China. And I think doing that is very important because in the future, if we ever get the chance to interact in business or in politics or in trade, um, we will always, and I, I think it's, you know, a moral imperative for us to think about not just the government officials that are sitting across the table, but the people who are impacted in China and as well as in the United States. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think all of those are fantastic insights into uh, China and the United States, especially, you know, and more broadly, how we got to view the world, how people got to view in China, bringing it a little bit even closer to uh, the Schwarzman's experience. Um, the program is comprised of about Approximately 40% of the student body is U.S. scholars, 40% are international scholars, and the remaining 20% or so are Chinese scholars. Um, so a very wide range of diaspora, a wide range of perspectives. What do you all view as critical, um, critical ways as a class for you all? to connect with the scholars of other countries and in particular the chinese scholar student body who many are who studied abroad some of them have experienced the united states or the uk or other countries for high school or college education even and some of whom have studied straight through the chinese academic system with the Tsinghua, Renmin, uh, other great universities, Beida, um, but have not necessarily traveled or had significant interactions with international students. What do you all view as kind of vital ways in which the scholars can engage and learn from each other? And how? I mean, for me, so much comes down to the informal hanging out. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, I think I've loved the conversations I've had with my sweet mates in common rooms or actually one of my first and most memorable conversations was with Elliot, like freshman year <laughs> or sophomore year, one of them in the dumpster dining hall, him and a couple other people. And it's those conversations where you just dive deep into issues in a super casual setting that end up building the, the real connections that you can then lean on in classes and while you have, you know, important content to be discussing and working with. And so, I mean, I, I love to play soccer. And so I'm hoping that there'll be plenty of sports and, and stuff to, to, to do while we're there. And just more of those kinds of fun activities, whether it's athletics or, you know, going to bars around, I think that those are the interactions that I'm most looking forward to, to making the connections. Definitely. Yeah, I think one of the great things with the Schwartzman program is like how it's residential and you kind of study where you live. And I think Arjun's point to like how you can both interact with people in the dining hall through social activities, through soccer, through whatever you do, and then take those insights literally to the next room over in the classroom. I think Schwartzman is probably really well designed for those types of like connections uh, to play out. Yeah, I guess just the size. So intimate, 150, uh, like William said, 40, 40, 20% division. Like Harvard is, what, 6,000, 7,000 undergrads at one time? Yeah, for one year. And then, you know, a quarter of that's gone and it's replaced. And Schwartzman, you get to spend an entire year with 150 people. I think that would really, really help with the discussion. Definitely. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, I definitely agree with Arjun's perspective. Like when you kind of hang out with someone in an informal setting, uh, it immediately humanizes them in a way that when you later on inevitably have a disagreement or, you know, um, are having, you know, a discussion about something you both passionately uh, see differently, you know, that person is like a person, you know, they're a good person, you've laughed with them. You, so you, you don't take necessarily the disagreements as personally. And I think that opens up um, an unforeseen road to maybe, if not come to an agreement, um, at least someday down the road, be able to come back and try to try it again. 
Yeah, and that that needs to happen. So I'm looking forward to that. And then as far as like um, the 40 40 20 split, I think that's awesome. I think it's a much you know more diverse split than Harvard has. Um, I think Harvard's international population is only like 10 or 15 percent. Oh, yeah. So that'll be really cool. And I, I don't think there's many other programs like that that are offered. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to meet people from around the world and just talk about stuff, see the way they grew up, what they learned and, you know, kind of share the same thing from my end. Absolutely. And you'll all definitely have the opportunity for sports. It's a big thing. Tsinghua, one of Tsinghua's models, uh, you know, was in the wider campus is no sports, no Tsinghua. So <laughs> very much so. And soccer, of course, is as popular as any sport. Um, soccer and basketball are pretty big. So uh, for those that uh, want to participate and compete with the intramural teams within the wider Tsinghua system against the other graduate schools, you all have the opportunity uh, this fall and winter and spring to compete. And, Perfect. you know, we, uh, for our year, we won a number of champions number of matches uh, we were uh some of my cohort members led us to win the uh frisbee ultimate frisbee i think uh, competition the Tsinghua champions into murals and we were very close on the other sports as well so big shoes to fill absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely um i think this is a particular question for andy as one of the chinese scholars and again the 20 percent for the American and international scholars, what can what might you share where you think would be important for the scholars as they're coming into China, some for the very first time, so good portion, never been to China before, mm -hmm. good portion, never spoke Chinese. Um, what should they know, you know, coming into China a little bit? And also perhaps what should they know or how might they experience and engage with their Schwarzman Chinese scholar classmates? I think first, um, all very welcoming, welcoming country. I and mean, you guys have all seen the memes where it's like white guy speaks, uh, orders uh, <laughs> food in Mandarin, he gets like 2 million likes. Like, <laughs> and it's like, I mean, like people are very like, they're like curious that, you know, like, um, I think all of you have studied Chinese at some point, right? Like if you speak, you, even it's like a basic conversation, like everyone will be impressed and they're like, we're, we're very hospitable. And um yeah there's not that much like antagonism i think that's just um maybe more of a political stance i mean i don't want to talk more about this but uh let's say in terms of engaging with the uh chinese scholars i know of them now like i've we zoomed like a couple times i think they're all really chill they're all like um very international i think more than half of us go to u.s colleges and the other half it's like Tsinghua yeah. or Beida, Fudan, sort of like the top like Chinese colleges or they're from Hong Kong or Macau. So I think it's, it's already like within China, it's very diversified. So I think we'll mix right in. Um, what are some, again, maybe to you, but maybe for you guys from your experience <laughs> in China and for scholars, perhaps or for those that might be interested in studying in China in the future, whether it's for the Schwarzman's program or just study in China as an opportunity. What are some unique cultural customs in China that you think people should know about or was a really you know different experience from being here in the US or elsewhere that you know people should just like you know that's surprising that people should know <laughs> it might take a minute I, I've never been to China, but they teach you in elementary Chinese at Harvard. I don't know if this is fully true <laughs> that you don't like say hello like you do in the US. Like you'll often say like a verb of like what people are doing, like liu go or something like that, like mm. walking a dog or like chu fan la, like have you eaten? So this is Harvard Chinese. I don't know if this is Chinese Chinese, <laughs> okay. um, but this is what they say. So uh, that that was pretty interesting to me. I have my doubts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think Beijing compare. people say like chu la ma, like ironically yeah. now, but uh, yeah. People say like hi, it's just like <laughs> English is pervasive, you know. Yeah, this wasn't a necessarily a custom thing, but I remember the first time that I went to Wang Fujing Dajie, um, and you know, just saw every kind of meat on a skewer. Yeah. Um, that was one of those moments where I just had to sort of turn off the American brain of you know 
what are the cooking conditions that this was made in or, you know, has this been cleared by the FDA and just trust the process. And, <laughs> you know, I had a great time. I, I had some great food and would 100% recommend people take the same open-minded approach to food and, and going back. Yeah. Uh, the percentage of people in China speaking English is, you know, is much higher than the percentage of people in the United <laughs> States speaking Chinese. Um, and so I kind of hope that that doesn't stimulate the chances to speak Chinese um, you know, when they see someone walk in who like looks like they could very clearly be an American, um, whether, you know, they'll speak, chi speak Chinese to me or speak uh, English. Um, but either way, I'm really excited to meet those people and learn more about the customs. I'm, I, when I w last went to China, I was very young. Um, I went with my, my parents and I don't really remember too much. So uh, I think now I'll remember a little more. I'm a little older. So <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, some of you have been to China before, some not. What are kind of the travel opportunities that you all are really looking forward to? You get to have a pretty long winter break. You have periods of time where you get a whole week off. And in China, public transit, of course, is much more robust than here in the United States. You can take a train or plane, you know, anywhere pretty much within a 24 hour period uh, where, you know, and again, so few students, so few people are in China relative to pre COVID. So you're kind of, among the first still to really go to China after nearly half a decade. Where in China are you perhaps on your bucket list is, would be most interested in going to experience or re-experience? <laughs> <laughs> I think like, obviously would love to hit the top cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou and so on. Uh, but I am really interested in seeing more rural areas because uh, I think especially that's something that you really have no insight to from the U.S., not talked about in the media. Um, and I think there's probably a lot, maybe even cultural differences within different parts of China. And so I'm excited about being able to travel to those kind of like less urban uh, areas. Yeah, I agree. I want to go to the provinces that um, they don't come to your mind when you think of China. I think we all see or not we all see, but in the United States, we, we uh, are basically taught to see or, or um you know, loosely indoctrinated to see China as a monolith when it's not the case. There's a lot of different ethnic groups. Um, there's not just one Mandarin Chinese. There's many different Chineses um, and, and different dialects, et cetera. And so whether it's in, you know, in the countryside or, or in just, just to see the different provinces, how they stack up, how and how they influence each other. Um, so I don't have a certain place. I think I need to see it all, see it all, you know, the big picture come together. Yeah, I've slowly been building a list of not just places, but kind of events that I, I want to try and make it to. Um, I saw something about the Harbin Ice Festival um, that looked really cool. So go up north and probably freeze. But it, it looks like they build a whole city of ice that I'd love to see. Um, I was watching a documentary about the Silk Road. And so there was something about a certain time of the year where all of the silkworms are starting to produce silk and, and stuff. And so you can see that process happening. Um, so a growing list, but but those are some of the ones that are at the top of my mind. Yeah, the funny thing is I've never heard of these two. So <laughs> Arjun and I will, will go, Perfect. where are we going to be? Yeah, I've never been. I'll be a tourist. Um, for me, definitely um, going back to Beijing, going back home, um, enjoying that. And also I want to go to Chongqing. It's like a very underrated city, but it's like very like rapidly developing. So like a new second line city is I think what the what people call it. It's something straight out of like a Calcavino novel or something. And apparently there's like a subway that the train go, goes. Yeah, yeah the it, go, it goes through buildings. There's, there's a lot of like really um, magical realist elements. So I'd like to see that for myself. We've got our list. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you're going to be in China for 11, 12 months, uh, pretty much. You can travel, of course, for vacation elsewhere as well. Um, you know, China is definitely a very intense, perhaps a very, you know, exp experiential environment, especially if you've never been there before. But, you know, you're going to be, you're there, you're there not just to have fun. You're not there just to visit family. You're there to study. Um, you know, we spoke about how each of you had these professional interests before the program. Uh, what do you hope in your year to kind of really dive e deep into, whether it's in the classes or your capstone that you must do for the program? What's kind of the issue and uniqueness about studying in China that you don't get anywhere else that you really want to focus on in this upcoming year? I'm really interested in taking classes on uh, Chinese history. 
through a lot of lenses, political, legal, cultural, um, not too familiar except for the, the you know, general strokes that you get from studying foreign policy. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I think for me, uh, learning about Chinese economic policy, uh, understanding how that works at the regional level, um, even how like the PBOC is thinking about current macro conditions, I think that that's not covered a lot in the U.S. and, and hopefully I'll have the chance of, you know, understanding that in China. For me, there are kind of two broad categories. The first is similar to what Fawaz was mentioning, kind of how history builds self-image and then how self-image shapes action on the world stage. I want to understand what that will look like for China. Um, and then two would be kind of just what are the key areas that China is really prioritizing as its focuses for international action and what the contours of each of those priorities are in how they might allow for American collaboration. I think finding room for those joint undertakings is going to be really essential for de-escalating tensions and building a, a better more cooperative future. And so I, I'd like to drill into that while I'm there with Chinese people. I would like to learn more about global affairs. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that entails yet. Um, more emails to come, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, but the policy side of stuff, I think um, I've been always more of a, of a humanist sort of in that tradition. So mm -hmm. like sort of how that is applied. Um, not only sort of you know, in a legal way, but also in like an economic way and sort of in like a um, diplomatic way. it will be really interesting. Definitely. Uh, building a little bit on that, um, you know, what do you view in 2024, 2025 as kind of critical issues that China face, China is facing, um, that China and other stakeholders, United States, the UN, what have you, what do you view during your time there as potentially flashpoints, um, you know, issues that could really cause some international tensions that you're thinking about or is on your mind as you prepare to go to China to live for a year? The elephant in the room is Taiwan, for me at least, mm -hmm. um, and kind of how the combination of the recent elections in Taiwan paired with upcoming American elections that might shift U.S. policy towards the region and then kind of Chinese driven policy in terms of what stated objectives are, like how all three of those different events and forces might converge in the coming years, I think is is definitely a topic of major concern. Um, but then also the other one for me is I'm really fascinated in the triangle of the U.S., India and China. Um, and India is a country that is widely recognized as being on the rise right now um, in some ways is being talked about in similar ways that people spoke of China about several decades ago. And I think understanding how those three come together and their different goals of two countries that are kind of former colonies, not China, not necessarily having been formally colonized, but of a, a different category of international powers that are now gaining influence on the world stage, what that'll mean for international politics, international economics. Um, I think that's a reshuffling of the world order that could have a lot of changes. Absolutely. I think for me, less of a flashpoint and more kind of like a secular trend that's ongoing that I think will get more and more important is generative AI. And I think both US and China uh, are really the leaders right now in innovation. And so there's both the standpoint of the tech ecosystem in China and in the U.S. that's developing all these kinds of new and increasingly sophisticated models. And then the regulatory side. And I think we've seen that in China with the you know AI regulations and so on that have come out of there. And I think that 2024, 2025, we'll witness new models, new innovations. And I think we'll have to spend a lot of time thinking about how they affect societies and the types of regulations that are going to come out. Yeah, definitely what Arjun said about Taiwan is something I'm keeping my my eye on. Um, other stuff is uh, if the United States is going to continue to take a closed off sort of isolationist approach to our AI development and regulation, um, you know, whether we'll continue to pass stuff such as the CHIPS Act. Um, yes. And I also something else that's on my mind is, you know, potentially if the ongoing crisis in the Middle East as a result of the, the Gaza conflict, if this uh, continues into the future, how will China, if at all, try to either take advantage of it or reach, you know, extend their arms into the region um, and for what purposes? 
Yeah, I would say um, sort of the youth unemployment problem, um, especially long term. People have been talking about lying flat, right, tumping, um, and how sort of although China is still growing at like a good pace, but it's just not comparable to the past like golden age、mm-hmm. of you know the two thousands and how like you know people also have to cope with that. I think we're still、um, not ready to shatter the illusion. What are some you know building off of that some concerns with China's growth、uh, in the coming decade? That you are kind of concerned about as well, good or for Phil, you know we have an ongoing,、um, you know, concerns with economic growth. Of course, always GDP figures, but also there's the rising, you know, or falling, the rapidly declining birth rates that you know continues in China even despite policies trying to correct that. What are kind of big issues that China must face? That Chinese scholars perhaps will tackle in the decades ahead.、Um, that should you know that would benefit China. I mean,、well. I think from at least what I've been able to understand from the U.S., which might not reflect some of the reality in China, a lot of what's talked about is the demographic shift, the overreliance on real estate as the driving force for Chinese、mm-hmm. economic growth. Uh, and regional disparities、uh, between different parts of China in terms of economic productivity, and so I think the ability to resolve those. And you talked about the demographic factor. I think, as Arjun mentioned, India is growing really quickly, and India's demographic situation is completely different from China's. I think that's going to be a key factor. And coming out of COVID. Uh, the real estate one, I think, is quite important as well. So I'm, you know, haven't had the chance to fully understand the responses, but I hope spending time in China will allow me to better understand those, those issues. The other thing that、um, I would think about is just climate change.、Um, given that one, it's a global issue, but also China, India, the United States are the countries that really have to step up their game in terms of how they're responding. Obviously, in the last U.S. administration, the Biden administration has done. A lot more than previous ones have done in order to move the U.S. forward on that front. I'm not aware enough of what the situation is in China, but my understanding is there's still a solid reliance on coal that has been hard to move.、Um, but you know, whether that's for immediate health reasons or long-term climate reasons, that's something that is going to need to shift.、Um, and you know, that's a, a tough challenge to take on for a country so large. So that'll that'll be a, a complicated issue to deal with moving forward. Um, I would just add on rebuilding trust between, like, especially the youth,、um, U.S. and China, and especially how we can begin even to construct sort of a public sphere where dialogue is possible, and it's not just like、um, us throwing words at each other, especially after、um, a very bombastic president and like a particularly difficult, I would say, half decade. But now this year, like things have been looking up.、Um, President Xi was in、um, San Francisco not that long ago, so I'm very hopeful. Building upon that, for your generation,、uh, for Gen Zs and younger, right? I know, and you touched upon this, which is,、um, you know, there's a lie flat movement that occurred during COVID. You know, there's the quiet quitting here in the United States.、Um, how, what are your views on kind of like the Generation who are in power, who are significantly older, both here and also in the United States. Sorry, here in the United States and in China.、Um, for your generation、uh, and for younger generations, what are their thoughts on perhaps the wider conflict between the United States or competition between the United States and China? Is it markably different than you know what the folks are doing within the government? Right, the difference between the people and the government, but also between generations. Is there a difference? Or is it, you know, do you all feel it's the attitudes towards each nation, you know, internally at least, is consistent across generations? I mean, I think in the U.S., if you look at the presidential elections, both candidates are in the range of eighty years old, and lived through the Cold War,、mm-hmm. and a lot of their policy advisors also lived through the Cold War,、um, and I think that that shapes how you think about the world. 
And all of us, or at least myself, were born post 2000 in a completely different world. And so I think it's natural that the way that we process information and the way that we think about China is different from people uh, who have this very kind of like containment oriented view. So I think there are definitely generational differences, at least in the US and Europe. Building on that, I think there is, it seems less of a commitment in the United States now across parties and to some extent across generations to the idea that the United States has to be this force that is the arsenal of democracy around the world. Um, I think a lot of young people right now are you know, not very enthusiastic about what the United States is doing and, and where its military budget is being spent, how much is being spent on the military. Um, and there is a real desire to refocus um, on domestic issues in the United States and, and sort of prioritize those American interests over the rest of the world. And obviously there is quite a bit of diversity of thought there. I think there are still a good number of Americans who feel that the United States is a leader in the world and should continue acting as one. Um, but I think it's, to Elliot's point, less taken for granted that the United States is and must continue to sort of play this big power role on the international stage um, in terms of great power competition with China and in uh, any number of conflicts around the world. Yeah, I think general doctrine in the United States has very much been, especially in the foreign policy realm, one of liber liberalism spreading our democracy, you know, quote unquote, um, abroad and in containment, like not allowing competing ideologies to spread. Um, and I think now that kind of illusion of, you know, a lot of the premises underpinning that are kind of being shattered, um, A, by what's transpiring in the world now um, in Gaza and, you know, sort of the relationship between different powers um, in, in that conflict, but also uh, I think the presence of social media and the fact that a lot of the things that, you know, for example, the label of Chinese as anti-democratic or, you know, a lot of the things that you hear perhaps in news or perhaps in foreign policy briefings and uh, for justification of a certain action or stance of the United States takes towards China. Um, now on your phones, you can see abundant examples of actions that the United States mm -hmm. takes that are perhaps um, reminiscent of those very same accusations. Um, and so I think that's actually awakened our youth in a lot, in a lot of ways to like kind of question this unwavering solidarity, or excuse me, this unwavering um, support of all U.S. actions, on, you know, with China or with other countries in the world. And I think that provides an opportunity because one day it will be these American youth who are going to be, you know, doing the relationships with China and with other countries and um, for them to be a little bit more critical about their own history and the way it's looked, um, I think will go a long way towards a, a better relationship. Yeah, Fawaz, that was a great point. I was just add, I feel like what's being challenged here is a deeper narrative of globalization, sort of in like the Soros vein. The idea that if everyone becomes more economically prosperous, all the other things would just follow, right? And then as we increase global trade, we'll have um, more, you know, like freedom of opinion, like freedom of expression, blah, 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 blah. Like, but I think that in itself is being challenged. And America has become increasingly, I think, isolationist. Maybe for good, maybe for worse, but um, clearly like a new world order is being sort of born as we speak. Um, and I think, like you said, like the youth will have a big role to play in it, as, especially as a volunteerist. And I think um, I want to see what like we can and what the program can make mm -hmm. out of that. Uh, the program is there for a year. You're all going to go, assuming nothing changes, no crisis. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you're all very young. You're all set to go and you'll know, graduate around 23. You have your whole life ahead of you. What specifically for each of you, you know, after the program, do you view one as kind of the value of your the program to your mission, your life focus, and two, uh, you know, what is that specific like focus you want to tackle on, whether it's a few different careers, whether it's, you know, a singular path that you might have mapped out for yourself for 20, 30 years. Um, yeah. What, what is that going to be post-program for you all? For me, um, I have sort of two career interests that will come together in some way, hopefully down the road, one being kind of state level or even local level politics in the United States and the other being American foreign policy. And I think I'm really excited for next year to contribute to both of those in different ways. 
on the local and state level politics side, um, there are a lot of things that China has done really well in the last 20 years. We were talking earlier about public transit and infrastructure. Um, I think when it comes to building trains in the United States, um, that is something that has real potential to connect people with opportunity and, and connect large chunks of the country or, or within a state, different communities together. And I would like to see whether there are best practices that I might learn while in China that, that might be able to be transplanted here. Obviously, different environment, different standards, different expectations, but you know, there's, there's a lot to learn and I hope to do so. And then from the foreign policy side, again, like we were talking about earlier, I think there's just a much deeper understanding that can hopefully be drawn um, that I think I will try and brand as expertise when, when shopping around for jobs and say, you know, this is what I learned about how China is presenting itself to the world and, and going about its policy in the future. Um, and this is how we can plan around that. Yeah, I want to learn about um, the U.S.-China relationship on, a, on various uh, issues such as climate, such as AI. Um, and I want to basically take that information, take that knowledge that, and afterwards bring it to the international legal context. Um, I think I, my, my goal is to work as a lawyer, either within you know some sort of state department or other department, um, and try to increase the emphasis in the United States on you know engaging with the rest of the world on treaties, not just by making them, um, but also by adhering to them, which is a problem that we've had um, in the United States for a while. And so I think litigating in courts on the basis of international treaties, um, kind of understanding what those treaties are trying to do, because I was in China, you know, trying to learning about those issues and discussing them and debating them with other people. I think that's going to be very useful. Um, and I think, you know, someday, you know, that would be temporary. Someday when I'm done uh, litigating, I would hope to like actually be at the table and with other people and, and writing up those treaties and um, as well. And so I think this would all be very good practice, very good experience for that. I think my hope is to work in, in economic policy, specific, international economic policy focused on the impacts of AI on our societies. And I think that the value add that Schwarzman provides, we've all touched on this, is being that person who can be at the table and who can say, I understand the US perspective or the European perspective, but I can also tell you what the Chinese people on the other side are thinking about AI and how they're thinking about AI innovation and AI regulation and how they're thinking about how that's going to affect China. And so ultimately, I think the program offers really the opportunity to understand the regulatory side, the innovation side um, of these technologies and of economics. And, and I think that'll be really helpful to my career. Yeah, I would say what interests me both sort of is um, China losing soft power and like what soft power even is and sort of the increasing importance of soft power above and beyond uh, maybe like economic power um, or industrial power in the 21st century. And that's why I want to pursue like a PhD in philosophy to learn about sort of um, how ideologies are constructed and how um, sort of soft power sort of flows or right, interdirectionally. And um, I would say Schwarzman for me then would be a way to explore the dialectical relationship between theory and praxis and, you know, just like not be hauled in, like walled into an ivory tower for a bit. Yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, this is the longest podcast episode recorded yet. So I want to thank you all for joining me and sharing both a bit about your, each of your individual stories, your Harvard experience, your Harvard education for those that might be interested in, attending this fine university, as well as those who are here now at various programs and colleges. Uh, but also, of course, a little bit of an insight for those who are interested in studying abroad in China, whether it's for the Schwarzman's program or any other program, how vital perhaps it is to have this conversation, to learn uh, another's perspective, uh, and to hopefully given our viewers, listeners, some insights into China, into Harvard, into and each of your, no doubt, inspiring and impactful lives. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.